So thank you again for joining us for the Sturgeon in the Classroom Aquarium Best Practices webinar. As I stated earlier, um, my name is Megan Goss and I work for MSU Extension and Michigan Sea Grant. And we have um, two uh, expert hatchery managers here today that will be sharing information related to raising a sturgeon in the classroom and also uh, highlighting some different curriculum that can help provide support for this effort. Um, the Sturgeon in the Classroom program is supported by many partners, including uh, the Sturgeon for Tomorrow Black Lake chapter, the St. Clair Detroit River chapter, the Conservation Fund, Saginaw Bay Wind, uh, the Northeast Michigan Great Lakes Stewardship Initiative, um, and of course, uh, Michigan Department of Natural Resources, MSU Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, and the Little Traverse Bay Band of Adawa Indians. This webinar has also received support uh, through the NOAA Bee Wet Grant uh, to provide additional funding for closed captioning when it is posted online and available in a recording form for all attendees. So now I will share an overview of our presentation before I introduce our uh, hatchery managers. So uh, we'll begin with uh, highlighting general sturgeon culture, including resources, um, setting up the tank, um, and different best practices, and also the nitrogen cycle, and then some of the daily tasks that are involved with raising uh, sturgeon in the classroom. We'll also highlight what um, can be done if there is a mortality event in the classroom, because that does happen uh, when raising sturgeon in the classroom. After uh, we do the general sturgeon culture overview, then we will have uh, time for questions uh, by attendees for our hatchery managers, and then we will highlight different lessons from MSU and uh, the Little Traverse Bay Band of Adawa Indians, along with um, some additional uh, curriculum that has been developed through the Center for Great Lakes Literacy. And we'll also highlight some uh, citizen science opportunities. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce our um, presenters today. So we have two hatchery managers. Uh, uh, Doug Larson is from MSU, Michigan uh, Department of Natural Resources and MSU's Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. Uh, he uh, is joining us today. And then we all have Chris Dye from the Little Traverse Bay Band of Adawa Indians, and they will be both sharing information about uh, raising sturgeon in the classroom and their experiences as being hatchery managers raising sturgeon. So we really appreciate you both being here for this webinar and we look forward to learning from you today. So thank you both and take it away. Thanks, Megan. Um, first wanna thank Michigan Sea Grant for putting this together today. Uh, as Megan said, I'm Doug Larson. I'm from Michigan State University Department of uh, Fisheries and Wildlife. Uh, the first thing I want to emphasize to everybody today is that most everything that comes out of today's webinar is coming from literature that was produced by uh, Michigan State University and, and some of the experiences by myself and Chris and others that have participated in this project. And so I'd like to direct everyone, uh, if you have a chance and you're looking for some reading, background reading about Lake Sturgeon culture, uh, or some of the methodology that we talk about today, I would point you to uh, our website at glsturgeon.com. If you click on the About Us link and select Publications, you will be able to find all of the papers that have been produced by Michigan State University as a part of the Black River Sturgeon Facility over the last two decades. Uh, you can also use a Google Scholar search looking for Lake Sturgeon Recirculating Aquaculture. There is a wide base of literature that does not encompass Michigan State University, uh, and it is worth taking some time to understand the background and underlying methodology that goes into this. Okay, um, so we're first gonna talk about what the equipment used to look like for this program. And so broadly based on materials that were selected for the Salmon in the Classroom program, classrooms were recommended to purchase tanks that were roughly 55 gallons, which would cost the classroom about $70, uh, a small stand, relatively inexpensive, and then an overhanging filter system like the one pictured here. Uh, you're, we're, we had recommended in the past an Aquion Quiet Flow hanging filter, which used a internal filter pad in which bacteria could culture and solids could be filtered from the tank. Uh, we recommended a couple of small bubblers in order to produce oxygen in the tank, and then uh, a chilling unit if the classroom could afford it to control temperature. Lake sturgeon have an optimal growing range of a growing temperature of approximately 24 degrees Celsius or in the range of 75 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And so we, would, we had recommended this system in the past because it was loosely based on the Sturge, uh, Salmon in the Classroom program. And it's, it had worked reasonably well for that, that, that use. But as we transition to the next phase of this project, we're looking to expand to a system that's uh, better suited for the amount of, of waste that Lake Sturgeon produce. One of the biggest issues with this system is the overhanging filter system it has to be changed frequently. And as a result, every time that filter is changed out, bacteria which grow on that filter, which strip out uh, harmful ammonia, uh, unfortunately have to reculture. And that removal of that filter is both not great for moving blood worms from the system, not great for solids removal, but also uh, ultimately results in the classroom having to start their tank over and can produce uh, uh, nitrogen levels which are not safe for the fish. So we're talking about tank issues. Um, Probably the number one tank issue has to deal with uh, the buildup of ammonia nitrite. Um, we got on the slide here, we have just a sim very simple diagram of the nitrogen cycle. Um, and you know, really ammonia is toxic at pretty low levels. Um, you can sometimes change water chemistry to make it not so toxic, but nitrite in itself is very toxic. So a lot of these classrooms a long time ago were having issues where nitrite would just knock their fish out pretty quickly. Um, so we had to really look at figuring out what to do next. If you wanna to go to the next slide. Uh, this is a quick diagram of the nitrogen cycle in your tank. And so everything starts from your blood worms. When they come in, your fish is either eating it or they don't, but that still contributes to the ammonia. And well, I have here ammonia and ammonium. That's actually just based off the pH. Um, but then well, what, what we're planning or proposing to do for most people and I do this at our facility, is that we use bacteria to actually clean the water, filter the water. Uh, this happens naturally if you've ever had a fish tank that had some uh, orange scum around the rim of it or on the walls, uh, that's the bacteria actually. And there's two bacteria and this diagram shows <clears throat> bacteria one and bacteria two and how they're related. So typically you would actually have to have one colonized to create nitrite and that way the other one could uh, kind of kick in. But if you go to the next slide, this is a simple diagram that shows kind of the balance between the toxic ammonia and the non-toxic ammonium. Um, just something for reference, I think a lot of people don't realize that this is related. Uh, depending on where you're at, your pH might be around eight, maybe even higher. Um, and really, I mean, for us at our hatchery, we're really close to eight. So we actually, at the beginning, a lot of times may have to get the water to be a little more acidic. Um, naturally, a process of the bacteria will create it to be more acidic. And eventually, I mean, if it went long enough, you'd probably have to add baking soda, but it'd be like a, less than a tablespoon or something like that. Um, but then we'll go over to, this is nitrite, or nit this is nitrate. Nitrate, um, typically nitrate can be in really high levels, uh, really high levels. Um, it's not until the fish gets to be adult where levels of 600 uh, parts per million, 400 parts per million start to become toxic. Uh, for reference on this slide, uh, the Pelston fish that was stocked out last year was 650 grams. So kind of right where that threshold meets uh, is kind of where I put the, the line where you should be concerned. But really, most of the fish during throughout the program are gonna be on the left side of this uh, diagram. So, I mean, they're gonna be able to withstand a lot of nitrate. Nitrate will actually off gas, as that picture previously showed. So what you'll have is that you'll probably not ever get above like 200 or, or even 300. But just so you know, if, if people wanna reference this, at the bottom of the slide, I put a uh, uh, actual uh, citation of where we got that from. So you can look it up if you want. It's a really interesting study. So uh, here we are, you're gonna be testing your water a lot. Uh, preferably, I mean, I would prefer if people tested it like twice a week. Uh, that gives you the best information coming forward. Um, log your data. I highly suggest that for any teacher who's being involved. Um, if something happens, this is the only way we're going to be able to track down what happened. Um, so be good about it. You know, keep keep on it. If we don't, uh, if we don't have anything to reference when we go back, there's almost no way to figure out what happened. And really some of the, the troubleshooting in the past has come from reading these 
data logs and figuring out what happened. You know, if your water chemistry is good, that rules out a whole bunch of problems. But the API test kit is the uh, test kit that I would recommend just for a, a typical classroom. Um, you know, anytime something happens to some of our classrooms, I have people send in water samples and I'll run a higher, uh, more sophisticated test. Um, but at the bottom of this slide, it shows the, the parts of the uh, um, uh, nitrogen cycle. So you have ammonia, nitrate, nitrate, and you can see how through time it builds and each, each one gets bigger and bigger. Um, so you'll actually, in your data recording, we can actually see this. And it's super cool. And once we know that we're past the nitrite spike, you're kind of you know, free, free sailing after that. Uh, you shouldn't have to be changing your water. Um, you really, I mean, you have to add water. Uh, evaporation actually starts to take its toll. But to get to this point, uh, it's really important too to prime your tank. So maybe you have it already started and that your fish comes into an um, environment that's already inviting. Um, so if we go to the next slide, this is, this is the slide from before, but we're just actually replacing bloodworms in the fish with granulated urea. You can buy this stuff off Amazon, super cheap. Um, we actually set up just a little automated feeder that goes off three times a day. Uh, it costs 17 bucks for a little feeder. You can probably get 10 years worth of urea for like five bucks. Um, but it just takes a little bit of urea and you can actually prime that bacteria without having a fish in there and it just kind of automated. Um, once it gets going, it's actually consuming the ammonia as fast as it enters the system, which is kind of cool. Um, we have a tank at our, our facility right now that's got Cisco in it, but I still have a timer feeding the, the bacteria below. And it's kind of important too to remember that the bacteria are still a living creature. Uh, you know, you still have to raise these. So if you go like a week without adding any ammonia, you've probably just killed your entire filter and you got to start all the way back at zero and start building back through. So it's, it's important not to forget that you have something else going on in the tank. That's very true for if you have a, like a, uh, a break. So if you're not feeding your fish over Christmas, like some, for some reason, something happens and you don't feed the fish or um, maybe you took the weekend off and you're not feeding the fish, but he's still going to make it till Monday. You actually might have issues where you're starving your bacteria over the weekend. So just like a little automatic feeder can take the place of that and still keep your fish safe. If you want to go to the next slide, this is a super simple calculation on how to do, uh, figure out what kind of uh, concentration of ammonia you want. Um, the top left is obviously the equation itself. Um, the chart below, all you got to do is just pick out what your volume of your system is and what concentration you want. Two uh, parts per million is the recommended uh, like operating level for a biofilter. If you go too high, it's actually detrimental to the bacteria and they, they slow down. So you want to keep it kind of in a range. Um, I think right now the 700 uh, liters and two parts per million is a pretty good uh, amount. Normally I go for about one, uh, one gram a day or something like that. And so dealing with all of this, I uh, figured you, Doug talked about what we used to do, and now I'll probably get into what we do now. Um, we've shifted all, our, fi our fish tanks are being all shifted over to overflow tanks. We're using stuff that normally people use for like, uh, like reef fish, reef aquariums. And so a larger tank slows the change in water chemistry. So it's not as severe and not as quick. So that'll really help. Um, if you use a sump, you can actually process all your water in a place that the fish is not. Um, and Doug pointed out that in the past, there's like this little canister filter on the back of the tank. So you had the surface area of maybe an index card. But by using a sump, you can actually increase that exponentially. And we use, uh, in the bottom right of this slide, there's a picture of the media. Uh, this is just a moving bed biofilter media. Uh, specifically, this is called Miss Media. It's a company who makes it. Um, it's a little expensive to purchase, but the benefit is, is to the extreme in that it keeps, it keeps itself clean. It keeps rotating as long as you put a bubbler under it. Uh, it'll float at first when nothing's colonized on it, but once it colonizes, it'll actually become neutrally buoyant. And then 
the act of the bubbles going through the sump will actually cause it to hit each other and it'll shear off any any uh, like uh, overgrown bacteria. So it'll be efficient as long as it's running. Um, so that'll really help with any nitrite, nitrate spikes. Another thing that should help a lot, um, in the past a lot of the a lot of the schools had either like a canister filter where it's pressurized or they had like a, a hang on the back filter and you really want something that can pull out a lot of solids and not get clogged up because the blood worms do create a lot of uh, like the clear casings will float around even the wasted blood worms but if that stays in the tank and in the system it'll actually create like this little time bomb so something that you weren't expecting and all of a sudden it'll just release a ton of ammonia you know because your, your biofilter has to take time to build up to a certain amount once you've reached that, if you throw in another ammonia bomb, it's not going to be able to, you know, eat it up fast enough before it hurts your fish. So on here, I have listed that we're actually switching everybody over to sock filters. You can run them through the washing machine. Um, they're pretty inexpensive. I think for our classrooms, we're going to have everybody start out with four. Uh, that way, you start off every morning, you clean your tank, you take out the sock filter, put in a new one, and then you go either wash in the sink or do something like that. For those of you, to jump in here, those of you who've been to the Black River Sturgeon facility, this is the technology that we use in the entire facility. So this is how we clean the water that moves through the facility. We catch macroinvertebrates in here, we catch other fish in here, and these sock filters are very efficient, both in filtering water and then, uh, of course, cleaning. So uh, just as, just wanted to reiterate here what Chris mentioned, these sock filters are, are much less work for the teacher, and by pulling them out, you're not pulling your bacteria out as well. And this, like he said, that's what those guys have is a sock filter for the whole building. This whole system is a miniaturized version of what people all over the world use to raise sturgeon, sturgeon in uh, recirculating aquaculture systems, RAS. Um, it's done all over the place, so we're really just taking that technology and making it smaller. Uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, we just have to make it smaller. So that's what we're doing here. Um, it's, and it's really effective, uh, really, really effective. Um, if you want, you can go to the next slide. I think, you know, this is a picture of the tank we have. Uh, I do recommend acrylic. It's a lot lighter. If something happens, you can probably fix it. If it's glass, that's just it. You're done. Um, it's super light. We get ours from a place in Florida. Um, they're super helpful about everything. But having a 150-gallon acry uh, acrylic tank, I mean, it just makes things so much easier. Plus, in a 55-gallon tank, our fish were getting too long for the tank, and they couldn't turn around. They couldn't turn around. So um, about a half a meter is about as long as the last two, two years fish have been. Um, so you got to plan on some, a fish that's going to be pretty big. Uh, if you feed them the proper amount, they will grow at a pretty good rate, and it should be exponential. You should be able to predict it. Um, the sump here... It's not too specific on what sump you truly need. I mean, I think that the concept of a sump is the most important part. You just need to have a pump on one end, your sock filter at the other, and a way to keep the media in the center. Uh, this one shown is a, an, an acrylic sump that we've ordered for a lot of our classrooms. Uh, ours is actually missing the middle baffle, but it works really well. Um, just a lightweight, um, just, it, it's really nice. And it's marked too for ours. You can also convert a 55-gallon uh, tank, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Everything that Chris has mentioned today, uh, you'll probably notice, and, and when you're distributed this, this webinar, you'll have the ability to access some of the comments that are inside of the PowerPoint presentation, but you'll notice that they're relatively expensive. Um, we recognize that, and we recognize that this is a, a large undertaking by classrooms that are mostly funding this program by, by themselves. Chris has taken a lot of steps uh, in raising some of the fish at the uh, LTBB hatchery to simplify those methods, specifically uh, putting fish on a feeding type that's a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier to work with in the classroom. But nonetheless, you're going to end up with a situation where you're looking for funding. And so uh, Meg and Chris and myself are going to open this particular section of the webinar up as just an open discussion to talk about some possible ideas for funding this webinar or, or these these tanks, in total, the tank systems can cut cost upwards of $2,500, which uh, isn't entirely inexpensive. Um, there are ways to cut some of the corners uh, in building these tank systems. Specifically, one of the things you'll notice in, in Chris's tank system is that he has a very nice, well-organized stand set up. Uh, 
certainly you could have a teacher build those or a shop class build those would be an option. A parent that's interested in this program could help build those. Or you could simply decide that you don't want to have the stand system. And that will cut out a little bit of cost. Uh, obviously, the teachers that are participating, participating in this program now have tank systems already. They're 55 gallon systems for the most part. As Chris said, those can be converted into a sump system. Um, but that's still going to leave most of these classrooms short of the funding that is needed in order to purchase these systems. And so um, I've had a lot of experience and luck in the past, and Chris has as well, in contacting the local community foundations. For those of you uh, that may be in the Emmett County or Sheboygan County areas, uh, there's the Petoskey Harbor Springs Community Foundation has provided uh, a substantial, actually, amount of funding in order to purchase these tank systems for Chris's program. Um, I've had some luck with grant funding opportunities from the local health departments uh, for similar programs like this. And then um, as it turns out, my wife also runs the parent-teacher organization for our school. And so we've been able to engage the parent-teacher organization uh, in our, our son's school to provide funding for these tank systems. But there are numerous opportunities that exist for funding, um, but it does require uh, an already strapped teacher to, to um, write grant opportunities for these tanks. And so um, Chris and I are both uh, available and help, ha happy to help with funding opportunities. Uh, there are other organizations. Uh, you saw that Brenda Archambo is on this, this webinar. Uh, groups like Surgeon for Tomorrow may be interested in funding these uh, tank systems going forward. And so um, I think the big thing here, and you guys can please feel free to step in. The big thing in, is that these funding opportunities do exist. And I, I speak for myself when I say I'm happy to help with these uh, funding opportunities wherever I can. And I would just add that in the Saginaw Bay Watershed, we have been lucky to receive support from the Saginaw Bay Watershed Initiative Network, um, Saginaw Win, and the Conservation Fund to help provide support for teachers getting um, surgeon in the classroom supplies. And another funding source could also be donorschoose.org. Um, you can develop different campaigns about items that you need in your classroom, and then donors can choose what they want to donate to. So it can be a little less work than writing a grant, but I definitely will echo what Doug said about the local community foundations. They provide um, a lot of support for different place-based education efforts, and this could be a great way to help um, connect a community foundation to your classroom and those grants tend to not be too um, difficult to complete as well so that they also have like mini grant applications and this is something that you can look at multiple sources and use match money too for this cool um, so obviously it does take a lot of money to get the, the top of the line models which I would say it'd probably save you a lot of time I mean, if you have unlimited time, maybe you could um, get something that's very inexpensive. But for the most part, people people don't want to have to spend all day cleaning their tank, and they're not going to want to spend all day, every day, doing something that takes up most of their day. So that's why a lot of these, you'll see that some are more expensive than others. Uh, the more expensive options are, are chosen just because it's a lot easier for the teachers. And when I'm setting up classrooms, that's my... One of my main goals is to make certain that the teachers don't have this huge burden. I'm going to try to make it as easy as possible. And for people who already have a tank, you can move to the next slide. It may be, if you have a 55 gallon tank, you may not have to worry about trying to buy all the components. You could make your own setup. It'll take some time and I can, I can give anybody some pointers. There are YouTube videos about this. Uh, you can find them uh, all over. We'll probably include links to some of them. But you may only have to just get a bigger tank on top, and you can convert your 55-gallon your into a sump. Uh, we've done it at our hatchery. Um, it, it's a little harder to get the sock filters to sit in there right. It's harder to get things to hook up. But, you know, in reality, if you've got to save a lot of money, you know, that may be one way, but it may, may take you a lot of time to accomplish this. So you know, there's a trade-off there. How much is your time worth and how much uh, can you get out of a grant? Uh, the big thing too is that sometimes tanks, reef tanks are not very common. Like if you go to PetSmart or something like that, uh, I forget what the pet store in Petoskey is, but they don't even sell reef tanks. So you may have to get an overflow and that's the top right here with the white background. 
what that causes is it's, it's siphon basically and it'll let the water pull in on its own and so the siphon is a big reason this tank is so simple and easy to use is that there's only a pump that lifts the water it just overflows the tank and it falls back in there's you know very few real moving parts uh, you'll just have a pump and a bubbler and that's all it has to run uh, you really don't have to worry about anything else um, and with your makeup of a new sump out of your out of your 55 this picture was just a simplified version I found, but really you don't even need two baffles on one end. You only need just two baffles total. Uh, make sure your holes are smaller than your biofilter media in your set. Um, it's all pretty simple and I think we'll include some links to products and stuff like that, that I'm a big Amazon shopper. So find it on Amazon, find it wherever you want. Uh, but all these are like really sim simplistic solutions. Uh, the stock filters, because they're not pressurized, uh, switching them out no longer takes where you have to shut the water off. You got to do all this stuff. You simply just pick it up. Um, it's a lot easier. Um, I think we're on to the next one, Doug. That's you. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about nitrogen cycling and how important it is to convert harmful nitrogen into a form of nitrogen that's not harmful to the fish. Uh, but there are other things that are very important to focus on as well. And so when we see mortalities in the program, a very large number are due to, to nitrogen problems, but some of them are due to simply uh, not keeping one's tank clean. And so with anything when you're working with fish, the first and the most important thing that you can do is write everything down. It is very difficult for us to go back and look at clues that could exist in the water quality data unless things are written down. Written down. So please make sure, um, whether you create your own data sheet or you ask us to produce one for you, uh, or you have one included in your, your startup packet, that you are writing down everything that you see. It's one of the most important things we teach our people in the hatchery is that the best and the first line of defense in keeping one's fish alive is to observe them every day and keep their environment clean. So the tank should be clean, siphoned, or netted out daily. And so um, we're trying something a little different this year where we're offering these fish a dry food. And it's not as difficult to keep the tanks clean, but it's still important to make sure that anything that's in excess is removed daily. One of the number one killers of young fish especially is saprolignia, which is a fungus that forms because you leave too much fish in the tank, or too much food in the tank, excuse me, or your tank environment is not clean. And so if you take the time to siphon after feeding, which takes one or two minutes, or you have your students do that, that is a very good and uh, effective first line of defense. So um, water exchanges should, uh, should happen a little bit earlier on in the tank installation. However, as you get the fish growing and as you've had food in the system, as Chris mentioned, you've built that nitrogen cycle uh, to a point where you no longer need to be changing water very often. As Chris mentioned, at all. if you almost never have to change water once you get a good nitrogen cycle going. And so when we originally did this, this presentation for other teachers, one of the most common things that we were told is that they were changing water every two to three days. I wanna stress that that should not be the case. If that's the case, then your nitrogen cycle is not what it should be. And the biggest issue that you'll encounter if you're changing water all the time is that tap water has almost no oxygen. And so, you know, we can oxygenate, we can do half tank turnovers, and those things can help in the event, event of an emergency. But if you're doing that very frequently, uh, you're introducing a variable that's likely going to result in the death of your fish. It's very difficult to control temperature of tap water. It's very difficult to control oxygen in temp, uh, of, of tap water. And in some cases, you're going to be fighting chlorine in your tap water. And so simply relying on a nitrogen cycle is, is a much more effective system. Uh, I mentioned uh, dechlorinating your water. Uh, I, Chris also mentioned at one point that you can detoxify your water if you have issues with, uh, with nitrogen. There are chemical treatments available for municipal water. It shouldn't deter you if, for example, you work in a municipality which which pulls their water from a common source and not well water. There are chemicals available to you and links will be provided in this PowerPoint as well. But again, focusing on daily cleaning and, and keeping an eye on your nitrogen cycle will uh, alleviate most of these problems. Um, you should scrub the sides of your tank to remove algal growth as, as often as possible. You will see algal growth show up every couple of days. 
simply wiping down the side with a, uh, a scratch pad or um, generally we try to keep our hands out of the tank. So they make long handled scratch pads that can clean those off. Uh, and of course, if your system uses sock filters, please make sure you change those as often as needed, which is generally on a daily basis. So I did notice two things, you know, definitely with this tap water, that's an excellent example of why we write things down. We were having some schools losing their fish out of the blue and we couldn't figure out why. They hadn't written anything down, so we couldn't figure that out. But then we started getting teachers who were recording things and the data showed that the water was perfect and we couldn't figure out why. And it wasn't until we showed up to somebody who just had an issue and then we started noticing a, they wrote on the sheet that they were t t changing the tank water and then they put how much. It was always on the day of or the day after the fish died. And so we started running some experiments, testing it. Basically the cold water comes in and sits on the bottom right where your fish is, it has zero oxygen. And basically it, it feels like he went into space and took his helmet off. Uh, sturgeon are remarkably, I don't know how to put it. They, robust. Yeah. Robust, I mean, they can withstand that and still be alive for almost a day, two days being brain dead. So there was some, delay in that and that's partly why we couldn't track back the origin of it but once we got a good handle on it those basically stopped altogether. you know having teachers instead of filling the tank from the top fill from the sump you know in overflow tanks they actually will show the water level in the in the sump and not in the tank uh, the tank is just an overflow right it'll always be at the same level but the sump can actually draw down so you'll be filling that and that way all the water is going to the sump it's rolling around in all those air bubbles in the in the filter and whatnot. Um, so that's a real good one. Um, Seachem products, I had just heard about them a few years ago and I've been testing them out. Seachem Prime seems to work really well and also uh, there's stability. Those two things, one will clean your water, uh, keep it safe from like chloramine, uh, which is something that most municipalities use. Um, but it also, I think it'll offset uh, your ammonia issues. It'll change the pH to more of a stable uh, state. Nitrite itself is actually less toxic to sturgeon if there's salt in the water. I mean, it's like two orders of magnitude more that they can withstand with just a little bit of salt. So I'm pretty certain that uh, I think it's Prime has that. And then there's a second chemical stability, which actually has the bacteria that prime that filter. So if you are on a regimen where you're trying to prime your tank ahead of time, uh, that's a great thing to kind of get started. I mean, it only takes like a cap full every week or every five, four or five days. Uh, it's really not that much. Uh, and it can really progress things faster. Uh, we're currently working on some other stuff that'll really uh, hopefully speed things up. So we mentioned that we need to record data, but what data do we record? So Chris has provided us with this data sheet that uh, he uses as an example of what you might record. And so there are a couple of things that we record daily in the hatchery that would be beneficial for you to record as well. Daily feed amount. One of the best predictors of growth over day over day is how much one, a fish was fed the day before. The second most important predictor of growth day over day is the temperature of the water the previous day. These two things should absolutely be recorded daily. If you're not recording feed amount and you're simply hand feeding indiscriminately, you could be offering too much food, you could be offering not enough food, and these two things invariably will, could result in mortality. And so it's very important to record these two variables day over day. I would also record observer initials so that you know who was taking care of the fish. One of the most overlooked variables in fish mortality is the actual observer. And additionally, recording fish activity can be super beneficial. Um, whenever we start to see any outbreak of, of sickness in the hatchery, one of the first things that we can always run back to is, did the fish look like they were not eating correctly today? Are we noting er noticing erratic swim uh, or no swimming? Those things are, are important variables for us, uh, especially if we're trying to diagnose a problem uh, prior to mortality. Another thing that you should measure, another group of things you should measure, you should do these weekly. Uh, lengths and weights are important just simply for uh, connecting your students with the fish and then also it's a good indicator of an issue with your fish and so we record daily uh, we record weekly lengths and weights in the hatchery and we'll notice if for example our fish growth starts to asymptote or level off 
in which case we know either it's time to do a feed conversion to a, a higher feed rate, or we're underfeeding for some reason, or potentially the fish is not eating for some reason. Sick. Yeah. So recording weekly lengths and weights can be a good uh, initial predictor of a problem. Chris mentioned that uh, ammonia and ammon uh, ammonium, ammonium, ammonium vary as a function of uh, pH. And so keeping uh, good records of pH over time is another good way of identifying if you have a, a nitrogen problem and where in the nitrogen curve you are. And then additionally, recording nitrate and nitrite weekly are, are super helpful in keeping your fish alive. And so uh, I think when you run into an issue where you start to see erratic behavior, these are not set in stone. You can switch to monitoring pH daily, ammonia nitrate and nitrate daily, and keeping quick records of those can, can help diagnose a problem because before it becomes a mortality event. Just a quick note, your ammonia and nitrite can test above the lethal level. Um, and what that is, is because you added the, the, the treatment. So don't be too scared. Like sometimes you get a level so high, you're like, oh my God, how's it still alive? And you gotta check to see if he's still moving. And that's really because you've done the steps to, uh, to be safe. But you still need to be aware that you're really high and you're kind of in the danger zone and you still got a couple more weeks till you're in the clear. I can't emphasize this enough and I think Chris would agree. Daily monitoring uh, will save your fish and then remembering to treat your tank as a living organism. If you focus on those two things, this program will be quite a bit more successful. And then if you ever do a water change, uh, even if it's a half volume change, documenting that is worth noting. Anytime you add anything to the system, whether it be a chemical or simply just adding water, it should be written down. Again, I'm gonna say this a hundred times, write everything down. And your water changes, if you are doing a lot, you're actually stripping out the food for your bacteria. So it is possible to know they're just getting started. So just be, be careful with that. Smaller tanks need water changes very often. Larger tanks, it won't, it'll take a lot longer, maybe three times as long for it to reach that level. So if you have a 55 gallon tank, your tank may have overloaded in a week. Well, now you go up to a 50, 150 gallon tank, it's gonna take three times longer for that one to overload. So you've been in that safety zone a little longer. And what that provides you is more time, more time for your bacteria to grow, more time for your bacteria to colonize. And so better volumes or higher volumes are better. And I think the results are pretty clear. If you've seen any of the fish that have come out of Chris's program, we had a fish last year that was almost, uh, I guess in feet, that would have been about two and a half feet long. The fish yeah. was, well, it was 500 uh, Half a meter. Half a meter, it was half yeah. a meter. Just under two feet long. Yeah. So that's a, a pretty huge fish at year one. When we compared them to growth data for fish that were produced naturally, that's approximately a two and a half year old fish after one year. And anybody can get to that point. Anybody just, can, yep. Just gotta keep with it. Um, in terms of feeding, so there are some things to keep in mind. Um, classrooms are five day a week programs in general. Um, I know a lot of you teachers would argue that you work seven days a week and I definitely agree with you there, but there are times where you'll wanna take a weekend off. And so uh, it's important, particularly when you're in the classroom to make sure you feed the individual as quickly as possible in the morning. Um, uh, fish needs to eat and most of these fish have spent most of their life in a hatchery. And so one of their main daily cues is the lights are turned on, it's time to eat. And so feeding your fish in the morning and cleaning out any feces from the day before is very important to do. Um, I usually recommend two episodic feedings a day uh, is the way I've done it in the past. As they get to this size though, when you're getting them in the classrooms, they can go uh, a couple of days without being fed. Now I don't recommend that, but it can be done. Like if you're last over the weekend, I mean, I mean, shoot, if he's a half a meter long, he's gonna, he can last a week, but we don't really want to do that, but it is, it, don't be concerned. Yes. Food translates to growth. Uh, feeding on the weekends, if you are able to do it, if you have a parent who could do it, if you yourself are in on the weekends, if students are in for uh, some sort of a sporting event, we recommend that as well. Um, one thing we tell everybody is that uh, fish don't take Christmas break, and neither do we. And so we feed seven days a week, several times a day hatchery. The sturgeon should be treated the same way. Um, much like you want to eat three solid meals a day, they definitely want to eat as well. 
Uh, as for holiday breaks, it, you should, especially over the longer breaks, um, feed as much as you can. Uh, obviously, every, feeding every day is going to be difficult, but uh, if you can set up a schedule with your students, we very, very uh, highly recommend this. And Chris made a really good note here for everybody. Uh, one of the things we saw very often early in this program is that fish would uh, jump out of tanks and hungry fish are actively seeking food. Lake sturgeon are a sensory based feeder, which means they drag their barbels across the bottom of the tank looking for fish and if there are food, excuse me, and if there is no food on the bottom of the tank, they will jet ski, if you will, across the top of the tank looking for food. And if they don't find it, they'll jump out of the tank. So uh, tank tops are important, but mostly just keeping food in front of your fish is, is important. They, some sturgeon, depending on the time of year, can grow as much as 11% in body weight per day. And that requires uh, uh, that they be fed pretty adequately. Um, this, I would think, this goes without saying, but it definitely is something that we emphasize, and that's don't turn your water off. Don't turn your bubblers off. When you leave the classroom, remember that your tank is a living organism, as is the organism living in the tank. And try not to make any changes to that tank that you can, even if, even if it means you know, you're not feeding, you should still be making sure that all the other external processes are going. And remember, if you don't feed your fish, your fish are not feeding your bacteria. So I mentioned that uh, we're trying something a little different this year where we're feeding these fish a dry food. It's a little easier to clean up, but this may not always be the case. And one of the most difficult parts about sturgeon culture in general is that you have to take a food, in this case, inconsistent, uh, kind of gross feeding source and convert it into some sort of known feed amount. And some work done out of the Black River facility uh, by John Bauman gives us an idea of how we can convert that food into a way that it's consistently fed across different feeding days. And so it's a very simple equation, which takes the weight of your fish multiplied by your feed rate. In the classrooms, you should be feeding it between five and 11% per day. So in this case, we did an example where we provided you with the example of 8% of the feed rate. And then you're provided with a conversion factor, which in this case is subtracting uh, a constant and dividing by a constant. So it's a, a very simple equation which simply takes the wet frozen weight of blood worms and converts it to a dry weight. And then that food is fed at 8% of the fish's weight per day. However, if you're feeding a dry pelleted food, which most of you will be this year, you can simply take that dry pelleted weight, multiply it, or excuse me, the weight of your fish and multiply it by that feed conversion rate. You don't have to introduce the second step of converting the food rate to a dry weight because it's already a dry weight. So you take your fish's weight, multiply it by your constant 8%, and that's what you'll be feeding on a daily basis. And this is why it's important to do weekly lengths and weights because of course weight changes on a daily basis. And uh, if we go back to blood worms, however, this equation is, rel is available to you. It actually also works for other feeding sources like frozen krill. And so, Keep this in your back pocket. It'll help you uh, get an idea of what you should be feeding every day. And what you fed the previous day is pretty close to what the growth weight will be, growth weight will be day to day, if you even wanna go a step further and feed based on daily feeding. Uh, I see a question here that uh, normally we wouldn't jump to the question, but this is a good question here, Jeremy. Uh, what kind of pelleted food do you recommend? Chris, do you wanna take this? I mean, we're just using your standard, uh, we're just like a halibut feed or something, but... Um, you know, they like blood worms a lot more. Blood worms are also extremely expensive right now. So we've been testing to see if we can, so some of our fish were given blood worms and then try to go back to dry feed, which they do not want to do. But some fish have never seen blood worms. So they were very willing to take this feed. Um, I'm not entirely certain if you can get it commercially. You can get small. So we have generally hatcheries have commercial accounts with groups like Bio Oregon. Uh, that's a, a great source and you can contact Bio Oregon to see if they'll provide uh, small quantities of food. You can contact the hatcheries and ask if they'll provide a small amount of food. I, I mean, I, I know Chris mentioned that their program may be willing to do that as well. Um, but I, I guess I would start with trying to purchase it from one of the commercial vendors like Bio Oregon uh, if they will allow you to produce or purchase small quantities. They certainly package small quantities. You may have to buy them in one like they come in 22 kilo bags, yeah. so 50 pound bags. Um, 
So you probably would have to buy one bag at a time and they, they'll ship it overnight. I mean, normally it's like FedEx pretty quick, but you might have to calculate out where, how big you think he'll grow. Um, I don't have any numbers on that yet, but we're hopeful that this year we'll be able to come up with something. Yep, and the, and the shelf life on that food is generally somewhere close to a year if you store it in a semi-dry room, like a uh, chemical storage room uh, works, or if you store it in your refrigerator is actually what I would recommend. And your shelf life will be a year. And for the most part, these fish are not going to be big enough to where you'll be converting in feed sizes. And I don't think that I would recommend that anyway because it introduces a, a variable that you're probably not prepared to work with. So uh, if you buy one large 50-pound bag of food, if that's an option, um, you may be able to get through a, a significant chunk of the year. Right now, if you're if you are writing anything down to uh, right now, I think they're on one point five. But by the time you guys get them, they might be on two. I'd, That's millimeters. Millimeters. Um, but if you contact the feed company, they'll know what you're talking about. Okay, and then the last slide before we're going to open up the floor for questions is for Chris. Uh, what? Go back. Oh, you went. You went twice. Oops, sorry everyone. I was like, what are these signals my name? Where? <laughs> Here, there's a delay. All right. Ta -da. Here we are. So inevitably, a fish is gonna die. And I don't care how long you've been in it, it's gonna happen. Um, sometimes it's just their, their day to go. Um, if you're there and you see them at the early life stages, you'll know that fish put a lot of energy into quantity and not quality a lot of times. So these fish are putting out hundreds of thousands of little guys, but not everybody's gonna make it. Um, sometimes it's due to an accident, sometimes it's due to just that was his day to go. Uh, other times it may be disease related, it's something that is extremely hard to treat. And unless you have a, a veterinarian's prescription and a whole bunch of uh, FTA approvals, it's not really anything we can do about it. Uh, so just, you know, prepare yourself, prepare your class. It's something I guess could happen, but when it does, uh, you need to contact somebody immediately. Preferably you have a support team, staff, and they can help guide you through this. Record everything, all your observations, whether the fish was still gilling when you found him, whether he was on the surface, was he on the bottom, was he white, was he pale, uh, were his eyes bloodshot. Uh, that's an indication sometimes of um, like a lack of oxygen. Uh, sometimes they'll even have bubbles under their eyes, like in their eyes, under their skin. Uh, that's another one that we have to be, be careful of. Um, so the person, whoever you call, will hopefully help walk you through some of this. Um, preferably when you we get that question, like, what do I do with my fish? Most of the time I tell people, just put them in a Ziploc bag, go put them in the freezer till the end of the day or something like that. Uh, sometimes people bring the fish back and then we'll, uh, we'll respectfully bury it out behind our, uh, our facility in the field. Um, you can, if you want, bury it yourself. Um, I think that's acceptable in most places. Um, if you're traditionally, we would put down a small offering of tobacco uh, to say, you know, thank you for being with us or our time was, was, was worthwhile. Um, I'd too, if you can collect a water sample, if you're really concerned that that may have been a problem. Um, I have water test kits for my, my staff or my classrooms that we'll, we'll send people down they'll just get a jar put it in the fridge whenever I get a chance I'll go down pick it up and I will uh, oh yeah yep and I will get that um, sorry um, I'll get that that water chemistry and we can actually run it and I have really uh, nice tests that we can test for other things than what your test kit can um, and then finally the the main thing is you're gonna have to break it to your students I th I think sometimes it's easy to just try to ignore it or get caught up in it, but you really need to go through the steps of like actually counseling. And, I, and it seems like for me, I don't have to deal with students a lot, but like you're actually gonna have to work these kids through a loss. Um, and I've seen classrooms who refuse to name the second fish because they think, well, he's just gonna leave me too. Um, and it sounds really sad or, or you know whatnot, but it does happen. So we need to prepare ourselves and work through those st stages of grief. Um, if your fish was pit tagged, don't bury it in the field. You should harvest the pit tag or, or send it up to us. We'll get a pit tag out. So the pit tag is somewhat expensive. So we'd, we'd prefer if we didn't bury them all over the place. Um, and I think we go to questions at that point. 
Yes. So we've received a number of different questions. And if um, any attendees have any questions related to aquarium best practices, this will be the time to discuss that before we transition to discussing um, different curricula. So our first question was from Charlie. Uh, does the sump, hut, sump uh, fit underneath in that stand shown or is it separate? So this is going back to the- Oh, so the acrylic one does. Um, you have to call. So the guy down there at, uh, we go through Fish Tanks Direct. He actually knows to build the stand in a way that the back actually comes off. So he's had instructions and uh, we've bought six tanks at her five tanks through this guy. So he knows that the back needs to be removable because that tank, that sump is actually almost exactly the same size. It's about two inches or three inches smaller, but on your traditional stand, you actually wouldn't be able to get it in there. If you're building your own, just leave the, um, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, another question we had from uh, Mandy is, so what is the appropriate size a sturgeon should grow to after six months in a tank? Well, you guys could calculate it out, right? So we, if you are sampling weekly, you should be able to predict out, right? You just extend the table. Um, I think under, if as long as you're changing your feed rate as they're growing, you'll probably reach a maximum bowl, a obtainable size. Um, I know in Pelston, I think it's two years in a row, she's had a fish over 600 grams or something like that. So she, uh, she got really big. She got some really good fish. In those same tanks, she also had a fish at the same age that was maybe only about 400 grams. So it really varies. Yeah, there, there's, there's going to be phenotypic differences in your fish. Um, some of them will adjust to feed really well. Others will not. Some will feed more aggressively than their cohabitating fish. Uh, I, would, I would provide you more with a range than an exact value. If you're in the range of 300 millimeters to about 500 millimeters, that's a, a pretty wide net. Um, I think over 300. Yeah, really. uh, yeah, I would, if you're, if you're seeing that, because by the time you get them in general, they're between 150 and 200 millimeters. If by the time you get them back to us, they're still in the 200 to 250 millimeter range, um, then there's a pretty good chance that that fish was underfed. But, and I, I can't overstate this, if it, if it lives in your classroom, to that point, the survival rate year over year is still going to be pretty high. So I wouldn't stress too much about having a small fish, nor would I lose my mind over producing a fish that's 600 uh, grams or so. It's the important thing is that the fish stays alive as opposed to shooting for a target. Weight. Yeah, we've already we've had some classrooms actually slow down their tank, right? So there's a lot of variables. Temperature is one, and in most of our calculations, we assume temperature is uh, just flat rate. It's always going to be 20, whatever. But some t classrooms are actually cool their tank down. Yeah, I know I had one that was worried that they were going to overdo things. Um, th so their fish came out a little bit smaller, but I think they would have been on the same track as the Pelston tank. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about size unless your fish doesn't grow. If your fish doesn't grow at all or gets smaller throughout the year, I would be concerned. I mean, that's really why we track the growth too, is that yeah. if, it is, if it's just plateauing, I mean, we've had a condition where when we had the 55 gallon tank, they kept overloading the filters like, every three or four days, they actually stop growing for two weeks. And that's, once the water quality gets so bad, they'll actually stop growing. And when we upgraded them to a 150 gallon tank, gave them the nice moving bed biofilter, it, it changed everything and the, and the growth just took off again. I mean, it, I wouldn't be surprised if you got a seven gram fish and came out at like 700 or something like that. It all too depends on where you're starting at. I mean, some fish could be as high as 20 grams when you get them, some fish might only be seven. I mean, it, it, exponential growth, it depends on where you're at now to where you're going to be. Yeah, I, I would, yeah, that's a, bringing that all full circle. I would focus more on consistent growth and a consistent growth rate as monitored weekly than I would at end, at end goal. If you're growing consistently without, without leveling off, then uh, you're doing a good job. Yeah, happy fish. Okay. Happy fish don't move a lot. Thank you. Um, another question was more of a request uh, from Michael looking for an itemized list uh, for with purchasing ideas for starting a new tank. So I think that's something uh, moving forward with the Sturgeon in the Classroom program, streamlining um, the items that would be needed is something that we plan to do um, in order to uh, be able to share that information. And There are some listed in the comment notes section of this presentation. If you're a member of our um, 
Surgeon Classroom Program, you should have already received a, like a Sturgeon Care gu uh, Guide. Page two should have a list of everything you need. Great, thank you. Um, and then this is another partner um, who is working on a museum um, exhibit, and they were wondering um, if you wanted to include a sturgeon in the classroom aquarium setup for the exhibit. Um, is there any kind of lid you would recommend? Thinking more about, instead of keeping the fish in, keeping kids out of the tank um, in a space where you wouldn't necessarily have a security guard. So the the acrylic tanks are actually enclosed halfway on the top with a, a lid that goes on. So those are pretty good. Uh, some of the ones, I think the one pictured in the one of the first few slides actually has a canopy. Uh, those are kind of nice. Um, but for the most part, I guess anything you can put over would be good. Yeah, most tanks are going to come with a, a custom tank or a lid option. So I would, if you're purchasing the tank, I would spend the extra few dollars to purchase the lid. Great, thank you. Um, and just wanted to reiterate, here's another question about um, conversions of food. So um, with the conversions for food um, based on weight, um, do you do those conversions weekly as the yes. fish changes in weight? Yeah, so you could do the conversions weekly if you, if you sample your fish weekly. Um, if you decide you want to take it a step further and try to estimate daily growth based on previous year's growth, you could change the daily feed rates daily. In fact, that's what we do in the hatchery. We have an equation that says, I fed you X yesterday and temperature was Y yesterday. Therefore, you weigh this much today. And as a result, you should be fed this much today. So we actually do that in the hatcheries. You can do it weekly though, if you don't want to overcomplicate it. But if you're uh, mathematically minded and you're interested in doing that, certainly you could change that equation every day. You can do it real easy in Excel. Yeah, that's yeah. called the assimilation rate, what they're putting on. Yeah. Yep. And in general, the lake sturgeon are a very efficient feeder. And so if you're feeding them at about 8% body weight per day, that's because that's approximately what they can convert into growth. Mm -hmm. So the assimilation rate for sturgeon is generally pretty close to one over one. And just thinking about, I know many of you uh, might have uh, a Chromebooks in your classroom, but Google Sheets is a great option if you want to involve students in this and um, teaching them about formulas. I see a lot of connections with that for projecting and then also just looking at the data analysis. And I know that was something that uh, a partner shared in the uh, chat was yeah. Google Sheets is a great way to help track data and then also have your students involved in that process. I often have some of our classrooms report back their sizes in the Google Sheets and they share it with me. Then I have them graph it out. And if you do the trend line, then you tell it to predict forward. You can actually go out to your release day and so in like January, I'll have them predict the release size and it's, they're generally pretty close. Awesome. You look like a wizard. <laughs> uh, and another uh, question we had were, what are the dimensions of a 150 gallon tank? So thinking about um, classroom sizes, I know that there are some uh, that are, they have limited sizes in space in their classroom. Yep. That is a constraint, especially in science classrooms where you have a lot of different items that are already So in the place. new tanks that we have been looking at and we kind of go for and we've been buying, I believe they're four foot long, two foot deep, and about 30 inches high. Um, they're wider, like depth wise, than the standard 150 gallon tank. So the fish can turn around. Um, I know that was a big concern when we first started switching over is because some of the 150 gallon tanks may only be 18 inches wide, almost as wide as the 55, but they're just six feet long. So we, we try to get a smaller package in, uh, and I definitely understand not being able to fit it. We've tried some classrooms that are just almost impossible to find some, some place where you're not like in front of a window. And if you are in front of a window, uh, block out the light if you can. Uh, we, we have duct tape garbage bags, contractor bags over the windows to stop the light. Uh, if you don't, you'll get algae growth like crazy. You'll get high, high temperatures, like almost 30 degrees centigrade. So really, really hot. Um, also the fish is really stressed out. If you do encounter algae issues or if you really want a really clean tank, UV filters uh, would be something that you could add to the system. Um, it's an extra investment. So I would only go there if like you were really having trouble. Sometimes the tank actually faces the window and the windows across the room, there's not much you can do about it. Those tanks typically have a lot of algae issues. Yeah, and keep in mind too with Lake Sturgeon, there are two dimensional fish. 
Um, they're benthivorous, which means they stay on the bottom for the majority of their life. And so uh, Chris mentioned that they had some fish that were having trouble turning around. They're not a salmon. They can't simply flip up in the water column. They tend to spend most of their time on the bottom. And so a wider tank is better. Great. Um, another question we had, is there a method you use to weigh and measure the fish that you have found that works best? I just simply measure them on a gram scale. Um, you can take a piece of PVC pipe and cut it in half and put a ruler inside of it with a, an end that they put their nose against. That's one way to do it. Uh, you could do the same thing with a board and a ruler, but the, the most important thing is to get a consistent length measurement is to make sure that that uh, face, uh, that, that rostrum is pushed up against the solid surface so you get a consistent measurement. And then I measure with what's called total length, which is essentially the rostrum all the way to the tip of the tail. Um, what was I going to say? Lengths and weights. Uh, for Doug and I, we love the metric system. Yes. Not everybody does that. If you are trying to communicate to us what is going on, it may be very difficult for us to understand. Yeah, we're very metric system based. Um, somebody one time was telling me their tank was 68 degrees or 65. I had to go to my computer or my phone and figure out what in the world that changes over to because I am not great at switching back and forth. Or if their fish is six inches or heaven forbid 10 ounces. I can't convert that in my head. So if you want to go quick or uh, just start everybody off using the metric system, um, hopefully your science class is using the metric system, but don't forget. Great. Um, we have another question about um, the related to the system and running it. So a uh, teacher has kept uh, Brett has kept his system running over the summer, yeah. um, feeding Maria every week. And they have ended up with what appears to be a lumpy tannish brown bacteria in the top of the tank, in the top tank resting at the bottom. Is this most likely the same bacteria is in my sump? And should I move it underneath or just siphon it out? I would just siphon it out. Brett, if you can, I would bump up your, um, uh, your rate at which you add urea. Um, if you get one of those cheap, cheap feeders, you can even have it do once a day. I mean, I would recommend the small amount more consistently, but it actually may be going through a boom and bust cycle even. Mm -hmm. You do have bacteria and you probably have both types. They're probably just at a very low level right now, but you can feel free to siphon that stuff out. It probably won't help you in the end because uh, you'll want everybody down below where they can, I mean the surface area on those little wagon wheels is incredible. Uh, the only thing that's any better than that is like sand. And uh, my facility actually has a gigantic fluid eye sand filter that's, I think it's like two orders of magnitude more surface area per inch or something like that. Great. Um, we had another question about um, using a seeded bacteria filter to prime the tank. Have you heard of anything uh, for that, for using those for tank priming? I don't know what I've heard of that. I think I like to actually, so in my experience, whether or not that works, I mean, we have taken old filters that uh, were cashed out because they've been filled with uh, blood worms and we've frozen them and reseeded that way. I've not find that that works really well for somewhat obvious reasons. Those filters are frozen and things die when they're frozen. But well, I mean, we've reseeded with old filters and not had very much luck. I think the better option is to simply purchase the bacteria chem the bacteria seeding yeah. material off Amazon. That, that stuff works extremely efficiently. Yeah, and I think too, it depends how, and I'm not familiar with the, what was it? Uh, seeded bacteria seeded filter. bacteria filter. I'm not familiar with how those work or, or anything about it, but two, you got to remember when they're shipping it to, it needs to be in ammonia and it needs to right. be in nitrite. So those bottles typically already have some uh, bacteria and uh, what they need in there. Um, so it's, it's probably just easier to, to add. It's uh, quantitative too, right? So they tell you on the bottle what you have to feed per gallon or per liter of water. It's quantitative, you know exactly what you're doing, you know you're not overseeding, and if you're feeding consistently at the right urea concentration, then you know exactly what you're gonna get. Biofilters and this bacteria stuff, there's a ton of research out there. If you have any access to any literature, Google, a Scholar, anything, it is all out there. You can even calculate based on like the dissolved oxygen in the tank, you can calculate how much that fish just ate. I mean, they have everything. They even calculated how much oxygen that bacteria uses per like, I think surface area or something like that. So you guys can, um, you know, you can take our word for a lot of this too, but 
there's a lot of information out there. Great. And then I just time for one more question before we continue on um, to make sure we stay within our allotted time for the webinar. Uh, for the um, classrooms this year that are involved in the Sturgeon class in Sturgeon the classroom program are you recommending that all classrooms um, use dry food and the pellet foods for this school year uh, yeah uh, so I think that uh, that Chris has gone through a lot of effort first of all to make sure that these fish are on a dry food whenever possible dry food is the way to go now there is some lake sturgeon research that indicates that uh, particularly early on, it's difficult to get them onto those food types. But once you get them onto those food types, they will eat it consistently. Uh, think of it as like teaching your kid to eat their broccoli when they're young and knowing that they'll then eat it as an adult. So uh, yes, I would recommend that. Um, Bloodworms are gross and they're getting incredibly expensive as a result of some new environmental regulation uh, in Asia. And so wherever possible, if you can do it, I would definitely feed the pelleted food. Yeah, we've, we've tried to make it easier for the teachers at every step, and this was one step that we've been working on and think, you know, theorizing about for a little while. And now that we're finally getting to the end of this, we're realizing we came out with at least 30 to 35 fish that are loving dry feed. Yep. And uh, if we can make it that much easier for people, that's what I would like. Um, if they don't take to whatever you're feeding them, we can always go back to blood worms. I guess you can hold out for that. but. Uh, for the most part, you probably want to be feeding. I mean, you can put them on an automatic feeder. I mean, there's a little ro uh, rotating uh, feeder that you can get 17 bucks, and you don't even have to worry about feeding them over the weekend. Right. I, there are some issues where you might have to worry about, like, ammonia loading, but you can deal with that on Monday maybe um, or even slow it down over the weekend. Right. Yeah, and, and without getting overly technical, <laughs> bloodworms are gross. I mean, they're fly larvae that are raised in – gross ponds and as a result are you know the water that these bloodworms are frozen in is kind of disgusting and so you're introducing another variable and so if we can eliminate that by feeding uh by feeding a dry pelleted food i think you'll you'll find it's a lot easier on everybody involved and i just one more thing if you have any more questions i know we're done with the question and answer section but you're always welcome to contact myself i think chris would say the same yep. shoot us an email we can generally answer your questions relatively quickly and we're happy to and for additional questions that we haven't addressed um, during the webinar uh, through Zoom, we are recording all the questions so we can also follow up with you offline. Cool. All right, with that, we're going to switch into the classroom connections and highlighting different ways to further extend um, student learning uh, connected to the Surgeon of the Classroom program. Uh, so I think I probably mentioned earlier, we have a program ourselves at Little Travis Bay Bands. Um, this program, we first started, you were the original guys. So I was. 13, 2013 was our first year for that. So uh, we, we've kind of expanded from there. We've had our, had our, uh, our lumps with it, but this is a, a, I believe this is like the, the heading or the intro in the slide of, of the, a lesson plan. Um, I don't get too into the lesson plans. I do most of the tank stuff. Uh, we have an entire education department who works with that. Uh, they have helped put this together. I mean, it's really incredible stuff. Um, and it covers a lot of cool things. I think what's really different about this is the Anishinaabe Moan language in the course. Um, so we really try to bring the tribal perspective into this and give people kind of a different view of the world that maybe sometimes they don't get. Um, I think out of all the sections, the one that I didn't necessarily understand was border crossings. And I think that has to deal with having the teacher maybe come in more, uh, become more familiar with the Adao culture um, and maybe Native American practices in general. Um, and that way the teachers may be a little better off to answer questions. So I think that's what that second to last uh, section would be. Um, each, each one, if you wanna go to the next one, I'll pause for a second. So the next one, this is a, a, a list of all the uh, lesson plans we have. I believe there's 12 in total. Uh, the picture here is, uh, I believe it doing the mark recapture stuff in Pelston. Um, so it's kind of like a hands-on uh, section. A part of this too, and I believe uh, lesson 11 is the role hatcheries play. Uh, it's required for most of the classrooms to come to the hatchery and uh, have a tour. So we tell them, you know, what we're doing and kind of give them, you know, this is actually what's happening. Um, and then probably you know, most of our fish are all released the first week of May, last week of April. So they get a chance to come down to the river, they'll have a ceremony, and then they'll get to release their fish. 
Um, and they get to see adults. I think that's really important too. Um, connecting the dots. You just you saw your little fish. Now you get to see what the big guys look like. Um, yeah, we can answer questions too later if anybody has any questions. And then just briefly, I'm going to plug a couple of lessons from the Michigan State University program. Um, I've had the good fortune to work on both of these programs, both from the tribe side and Michigan State University side. And I just want to say these lessons on both sides are fantastic. And we would very highly encourage the teachers to use them in the classroom. Um, it's, it's getting to the point where the paradigm is uh, focusing on the curriculum as the most important part of the program with the fish being a very, uh, very beneficial addition to the program. And so obviously the fish's survival is the most important thing, but if we can emphasize on the curriculum, if you do have a mortality in the, the classroom, the program doesn't have to, to uh, um, uh, pass on with the fish. And so um, check out these curriculum if you can. We distribute the Michigan State University program through the greatlakesturgeon.com website. Uh, this is also where you'll find any information about our publications and just generally it's education-based Lake Sturgeon curriculum. So I highly recommend this. I'm gonna focus on two of the newer lessons that we've put out. Uh, the first is our market recapture lesson. So I'm not going to go through all of this with you. Uh, I'm going to give you some general idea of what the lesson's like. I'm happy to help if you have questions. Please feel free to contact me. But uh, this lesson focuses on a technique that we use in fisheries to identify or calculate population sizes when we can't simply drain a lake and, count, and count all the fish uh, that are present. This curriculum was developed with teachers uh, and, and based on Current standards, uh, each lesson is gonna give you a objective outcomes, uh, both with skills, knowledge, and dispositions. And then it's going to walk you through the steps to doing the lesson and how to do the calculations that are provided in the lesson. Um, but mark recapture in general, just very simply is, um, for example, we do this with lake sturgeon. We go out into the field and we sample lake sturgeon. And every time we catch a lake sturgeon, we provide some sort of a mark. And here's what some of those marks look like. So on the bottom right, this is an RFID tag. It's a coded 16 digit tag that we inject into the fish. We can identify that fish out of a series of 1200 fish. On the top right, we can use Floyd tags, which are visual tags that tell our divers not to catch a fish or that this counts as a capture for that fish. And so we go out and we do some sort of a mark on that fish. We release that fish and we go out a second time, we recapture those fish or we capture some number of fish. And so the ratio, of the number of fish marked times the number of fish captured divided by the number of fish that were recaptured gives us an estimate of population size. And now there's some math here and obviously you'll have the opportunity to, to go through that, but, but in short, how many did I mark and how many did I recapture? That'll give you an estimate of how many fish are in that population in general. And it'll even allow you to calculate a, a relative error rate associated with that. And so the way we do this in the classroom is twofold. The first part, we give you a visual aid to use. And so in this case, uh, I really like to use Swedish fish because I love Swedish fish. You can do this with marked beans. It's a really inexpensive lesson. You mark some organisms or beans and you distribute them through a population, resample, find out how many were recaptures, and then you can use that to calculate the number of beans there. And you can actually do this several times and see how close you get to the actual number of beans that are in a population. It's a really, really simple calculation and it's really powerful. It's how we do all of our lake-wide assessments. It's how we do most of our assessments on the Black River. And then we try to come back and tie that into data that we've collected. So then I provided you a data set looking at captured adult lake sturgeon males in a two year period, 2017 to 2018. This is real data that we generated on the Black River. And from this data, you can calculate the number of males in the population. And just as a, a spoiler, if you get a chance to do this lesson, it's extremely accurate to the number of males that are actually present. So this lesson is a really neat way of, of kind of enforcing on your kids, you know, using a very simple math equation. This is how we do management. And we use these assessments to then come back and say, okay, well, we have X number of fish in the population. We know we can take 1% of the population. This is how many fish we can harvest. And it gives you a very broad and simple way of, of understanding fisheries management, and it's connected to data that we already collect. So that's a cool lesson. The uh, next lesson, 
a little bit more hands-on and maybe a little bit more complex, but as we move towards the technological revolution and we have groups of students who are moving towards being able to write code, uh, a, we provide a lesson that gives you an introduction to R and R Studio. Now, most of you have probably never heard those, heard of those programs before, but very simply, they are a simple code-based platform which allows your students to run really basic statistical tests to give you an idea of differences between different populations. Um, R is open source, and what that means is that people write their programs, people write the programs from R and then they distribute them, and then you can use those programs to answer complex questions. If you're in biology, or if you're gonna go into biology, you absolutely have to know how to use R. It's getting to the point now where everything in fisheries management has some sort of connection to R. So while that may seem complex and, and it may seem like it's above what you know how to do, we've provided a step-by-step -step guide to do a really simple comparisons in R. And everything that's done in R will come with some sort of a YouTube resource that you can go back to and figure out how to, how to, how to perform that test in R. This is a really approachable lesson. We've tried to make it as simple as possible it's answering a very basic question about two different populations of fish and how they differ between one another. And so just like the previous lesson, you'll get objectives, you'll be provided with outcomes, and you'll get a lesson that has data that actually comes from our population. So um, the lesson is very simple. Like I said, it'll show you everything from how to download R and to how to compare these two populations. So it's very approachable. And again, I'm always open for questions if you have them. I'm super, I'm, if you're a teacher and you have trouble understanding this and you wanna know more, please reach out because I'm happy to sit down and do hours upon hours upon hours of our tutorials. And that could even be an option to connect via Zoom in the classroom. Exactly, yep. And, and uh, if you contact me, there's a pretty good chance that I'd be interested in teaching your kids about R because I love doing R. But as you can see, uh, without going through this in too much detail, you can make basic graphs in R, you can do basic statistical tests in R, and what you're left with is uh, a good way of looking at a population visually for the students. So those are just two lessons. Um, the third lesson, and actually the reason why a lot of this uh, came together is that we're putting together a citizen science project through Michigan State University Black River Sturgeon Facility. Um, the idea behind this project is that we have fish that move into the Black River and they pass a certain point. So we know that lake sturgeon are coming up, but we know that there are other migratory fish that come up like white sucker, like vervet, like red horse. These, and these other fish are never quantified by us because we're so focused on lake sturgeon. But one of the things that we've noted in the last three or four years is that predation is driving population growth or decline in some of these systems. And we have no way of estimating what the biomass of predators is and how that can affect other drifting lake sturgeon or small lake sturgeon eggs, things that get eaten in the river. And so using this citizen science camera set, we can put a camera at the mouth of the river and as these fish move up, citizens are able to look at this video and say, there's a smallmouth bass, there's a darter, and my personal favorite, there goes a beaver by the camera. And so we're providing this video over time during the spawning run and during the larval drift period with the hopes that the students will go back, look through that video in perhaps one hour snippets. Large groups of citizens could do this. It doesn't just have to be students. You could identify and measure the fish that are present report that back to us, we can then convert that to biomass. And then through citizen science, we have an idea of what the year over year biomass of lake sturgeon predators is in the river. Now this project is a work in progress for sure, but we've seemed to have fixed all of the kinks as you can see by these uh, links to the YouTube videos here. I totally recommend you check them out. Again, the beaver video is awesome. Um, uh, and so next year we'll be deploying these camera setups and by the fall of next year as part of the curriculum that MSU provides We will be deploying the citizen science project and we'd really love it if everybody who participates in this program Particularly if you have interest in doing this and, and your students have access to computers or, or, or Technology that you'd consider being a part of this because I think that this will fill in a really important knowledge gap that as you know as management entities we simply just don't have the resources to measure so this is a cool program, and I'm looking forward to deploying it next year. 
And before we uh, wrap up the webinar, I wanted to share some information related to the Center for Great Lakes Literacy. Um, this is a network of partners and uh, students, educators, scientists, environmental professionals, and uh, citizen volunteers that are dedicated to improving Great Lakes stewardship. Um, you can learn more by visiting seagull.org, um, where on the website there are a variety of resources um, from curricula to uh, science and teacher features. Uh, so it's a great way to learn more about different issues related to um, Great Lakes literacy. And uh, as a part of the Center for Great Lakes Literacy, there are the Great Lakes Literacy Principles, which parallel ocean science literacy principles. So this is a great way to further extend the Sturgeon in the Classroom program um, as a uh, threatened or endangered species in seven out of the eight Great Lakes states across um, the United States. Um, this is a great way to learn more about the Great Lakes and the importance of this freshwater system for our communities and local economies and more. So um, these are great ways to extend um, the learning uh, through place-based education. Um, and then lastly, uh, in partnership uh, with the Great Lakes Stewardship Initiative, um, Sturgeon for Tomorrow, and many partners, um, we have developed an adapted version of the Scoots Educator Handbook. Um, this features different lessons um, and resources, including some developed um, and highlighted earlier today in this webinar um, by MSU and uh, the Little Traverse uh, Bay Band of Adawa Indians, and also um, by Michigan educators that are currently participating in the Sturgeon in the Classroom program. Um, so digital versions of this uh, printed binder are now available at this link um, where you can access and download uh, the different files um, via Google Drive folder. So with that, we're going to open up for um, some more questions. If you have any related to curricula and further ways to extend um, student learning connected to the Sturgeon in the Classroom program. It doesn't look like we have any um, questions related to curricula. Um, and uh, I think the resources that um, Doug and Chris highlighted are great resources to check out and ways to further extend um, student learning connected to this. And I just wanted to echo what Doug said about um, having an, the opportunity to raise a sturgeon in the classroom is a great way to connect your students to this um, threatened species in Michigan. Um, but you can connect your students through these lesson plans even without having a sturgeon. So if you are unable to have a sturgeon in the classroom due to space constraints, these lessons are a great way to uh, partner and help uh, your students learn more about um, Lake Sturgeon and their importance for our Great Lakes communities. Um, so to conclude, um, Doug and Chris, I would like to give you the opportunity to acknowledge all the different partners that have been involved um, with the development of this presentation. Uh, very briefly, I just want to say thank you, obviously, to Chris. Uh, he's done a really great job in putting a lot of this material together. Um, we've got several funding sources, both uh, by, for Michigan State University and Little Traverse Bay Bands. Thanks to everybody who is a part of this. Thanks to Megan for putting it together. Um, if I could leave you personally with one final thought, when in doubt, write it down. <laughs> um, so thank you all so much for joining us today. We hope you learn more about best practices for uh, raising sturgeon in the classroom and also ways to further extend student learning uh, through different curricular resources. I wanted to give a thanks to our expert presenters, uh, uh, Doug and Chris. We really appreciate you coming and sharing this information with all of us um, in the midst of a very busy season for you all. So thank you very much for being here. Thanks everyone for attending. Yeah.